All right, my friends. Today's short is kind of today's, today's short. Today's show, a little short today. We have one person making it through the gates. Why did I? Was it was a vanity thing? Cry that you got to go big screen. In any case, you know, I'm always so small, hidden in the corner when I go to the dojo game with you. Uh, maybe just a couple quick words before we start the show. Um, we are working really hard behind the scenes to redo a lot of the program. It's a lot of tech work. Maybe that's not where most of the work is, but that's where my anxiety is because I have zero control <laughs> over that. And we got guys like Jack really, really doing a lot of work behind the scenes to change things up a little bit. And I introduce it that way because some of the things about today's graduate, Izzy Serious, great name, Izzy Serious. You'll see how he spells it in a second is that I think a lot of Izzy Sirius's journey uh, will be, would have been different, will be, would have, yeah, would have been different in Dojo 2.0. So let's start by looking at the scoreboard and I can talk a little bit about what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the first thing I want you to see is that Izzy Sirius, aka Darth Varg, has had an incredible jump of 475 points. So normally that would get you up uh, more than one cohort, but Izzy Sirius is just going up to 400, 600. And so I really wanna stress, I think one of the big differences we're gonna have here going forward is this is gonna be zero to 300, and then we'll have 400 to 500, and then, um, and then obviously 500 to 600. <clears throat> so that will, uh, you know, out of these two cohorts, we're basically making four, and that will just a huge difference in Izzy Sirius's trajectory, as are a lot of people here. You can see Crudiendo, for example. Dude's got 488. Actually, Crudiendo just needs to graduate. <laughs> the guy just needs to graduate. But as just as a simple point, like, you can gain a lot of points in these lower cohorts and not go up because they're so large. Okay, since we're here, let's look at Izzy Sirius's journey. Obviously, 475 points and 30 points a box. Um, and we'll see, he's done a lot. And um, one thing I just wanna say, we do not have notes um, from Izzy Sirius. We're gonna look at somebody else's notes to a game against him. However, Izzy Sirius is doing no the work in the notebook. Right, so the 10 games that, um, or it's three he's analyzed, have been put into a notebook. I totally understand. He says next time, next graduation, which will probably be soon, um, he's going to give me some games. Now, a couple things maybe I'll say about this is too, just in terms of envisioning how it's going to look later. We're going to get a column here, which is going to show how many... Um, how many recs have you done? And different recs will be weighted differently. It'll also show um, how, may, how many points you've gained or how close you are to graduation or maybe you're already past graduation. And then people can line it up to see who's done the most recs, who has gained the most points. I think it's going to be really cool. In addition to changing other things up about this beautiful scoreboard that we have. Okay, so before we look at the game, just want to say fantastic with the Maiden 2s, fantastic all of this stuff done, right? And then uh, just basically a little bit of everything. And then when we come back and think about it for a second, 890 is, well, once we split the cohorts, you know, that's going to be in the upper end of this one here, really, you know, already. Is he serious? Could already be going into the 600 to 700. So hopefully we're going to see him for a second graduation. A lot of people want to just see if their rating settles in that range. Another quick note about this um, uh, scoreboard is that we are going to try. Well, it's not entirely clear exactly how we're going to do it, but we are going to say, listen, uh, here at the dojo, we're into longer games and annotating them, but we are going to encourage the people under 1,000 
to play the 10 minute games, the 15 minute games, just to not drop pieces, because that is the essential struggle of this under 1000 cohort. We're gonna see it in the game that we look at today. Okay, so um, let's then switch over here. Right, we just have one graduate today. Uh, it's a statistical thing. I would say on average we have about four graduates, but on some weeks we're going to have less. It makes a certain amount of sense. Okay. Also, we want to call it statistical. We can say there's been more graduates in the under 1,000 than anything else. Why? Because that is the, um, that's where it's easiest to gain points down there. It, the, or rather, the more work you do down there, the faster it's going to show. The more higher you get, the more competitive it's going to become. The harder those people are working. <clears throat> Fun fact, now, at, this is a little while ago, well, last month, but NAZ series is already well over 800, for example. Um, but fun fact, the average chess.com rating of like anyone who's ever gone into chess.com is around 750, 760, something like that. So, and that includes people, you know, just maybe played one game and then left. So that shows that like, is these series, like, you, it's already kind of interesting, right? That I, actually, I shouldn't say average, I should say median rating is around 750. So you can see that he is passing it here. All right, first thing I wanna note about both of these players, I believe Sergeant Tom, well, Sergeant Tom has to be in here. Sergeant Tom is doing the annotations here. Maybe we'll look up Sergeant Tom a little later. But one thing I wanna say is, first phase of the game, they have done absolutely correctly. Every move, they're trying to bring out their stuff. So I'm not gonna comment too much on this phase. As long as they bring out their stuff, I'm not gonna say anything at this level. So here we go. Pop, 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 pop. Beautiful. Everybody's bringing out their stuff. At a higher level, we could quibble about dibbles, but here we're not. Okay, so up to this point, everything has been fairly logical. And now here's where the crimes begin. Okay, so um, white has a threat with C5 and black doesn't see it, okay? So there's a number of moves. Maybe the safest is to play a move like bishop a3. Okay, so black misses it and plays h6. One thing I've noticed too uh, is that for almost even at a GM level, it's oftentimes the case that like you get your pieces out and then you just don't know what to do. And so you play a move like h6. And h6 has a certain amount of sense. I believe black wants to play g5 next. But of course, the big thing is the c5 move hanging over black's head. All right, here we go. h6, um, c5, good move. And um, I think essentially Sergeant Tom is implying that H6 is a mistake, though always in the notations I'd rather see a question mark next to H6. All right, G5, arguably black should just take on C5 to get the two pawns. And now, <laughs> Sergeant Tom, you gotta take the bishop, Baus. You gotta take it, just take the bishop. A3. Okay, now it gets really weird now, you guys. Here it comes. So, g4. Um, <laughs> quibble about dibbles. So, g4, here it comes. 95, definite horrendo mistake. And now the bishop on d6 escapes. It's not toast anymore. All right, here we go. Now the game is like no one knows what's happening now. Now anything could happen. Okay. Um, I played bishop b3 to pin the knight e4, but a better move would have been b4. Okay. Now, again, this is a nice place to just talk about tactics. Uh, first of all, we can win this pawn, or if we want to get fancy, we can play knight takes f2. 
okay? So, I just want to repeat it. The, the place in which these games are won and lost is all on tactical blunders. So here, f6, and now white doesn't comment too much and just plays b4. That's their intention. However, at this point with f6, it was another tactical blunder because we could have taken and taken. Okay, so b4, and now fe5. Let's read... Um, and, and Sergeant wants 95. Make 95 makes perfect sense, but let's read then about Knight B3. Knight B3. This was a mistake, although I was trying to move the Knight to the Queen side and away from the threat of Knight E, the threat from 95. I don't know why I was so reluctant to play Bishop takes E5 and trade my Bishop for a Knight. All right, so here, what, what you're seeing is, I think, okay. I'm going to try to diagnose this. I think Sergeant Tom is thinking that he could have taken on e5, but there was a problem. This thing, right? This was the problem. Now, you could have played b5 first and then taken probably your best move, right? So I want to stress, like, for more advanced players, this might seem trivial or something, but from my perspective as, let's go, as a teacher, if I'm allowed to call myself that, I see that this is pretty common actually and what's being developed is just the ability not to hang stuff that's what's being developed from my perspective um, and it takes a while right it takes a little practice that's why I'm gonna say it again the key to progressing out of the 1000s just not hanging stuff so h5 black should be taking care not to lose the e5 pawn right good move and now Black goes crazy here, and, well, <laughs> we should definitely at least think about taking the knight on c6. That's the safe move. So g3, let's put a question mark next to it. Knight's got to move. And, and again, we're just not moving the knight. Thank you very much. And... Um, B6 looks very frightening to my eyes. Uh, well, for a variety of reasons. So now white is winning, clearly. Bishop E5. Um, was it horrendous, though? It's hard to imagine that's horrendous. But Bishop E4, maybe our life is simpler. Okay. Okay. Check to the miserable king on a6 would be the easy way of doing things. And then that's truly a mistake. This was a blunder. I completely missed the opportunity to play bishop g3 and fork the queen and knight. Okay, good. Good move. Um... And this position is actually kind of interesting because um, could white have played queen f2, right? Uh, my answer is, I guess, not, but only because, uh-oh, chess.com, what have you done? But only because of rook g8. That's the, that's the cold shower there, rook g8. I don't know if he's going to find it, though. Um, and actually, so, so let me just say, in our games is where we find the tactics, learn how to play tactics. And right there, it's, it's complicated even for me. So go rook, if rook f2, king f2, and maybe we're going to, maybe white's better, hard to imagine. Uh, there's still queen f5 questions. And then here we have to sack. Oh, chess.com, you're killing me, Bows. Oh, mm, 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 mm. And the bummer here is it looks like we're going to lose this guy. So we're wherever we, well, maybe, maybe, maybe even here we can escape. And we can't go here because of this one. And so here, 
In any case, I don't want to spend too long on this position, but I do want to stress that when you're learning how to annotate your games, this is the kind of tactics to really spend some time in and do some variations. Okay. Um, so in general, I think this is these are very good annotations for this level, right? And one of the things I want everybody to think about is that it's tactics where they need to improve. By the way, in terms of their opening play, let's go up to this point, both players have played well beyond 1,000 level. And something I've said in the past, it's not that hard to learn to play good developing moves, right? Um, it's harder to learn tactics. Okay, so they got that part great, fantastic. Um, the next thing to say, though, is obviously it's much harder to learn tactics, like to see that that's an issue. And the reason I'm going off on a tangent about this here is the notes are good, but they're of a general nature instead of going into tactical variations, right? And so general notes are always good, but you want to have a bunch of tactics in there. So, for example, on the move C5, we should have, we should say something like here, 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 and then black could say, well, maybe I'm lost, but I have two pawns, they're center pawns, you know, the game might go on a little bit longer. Okay, so it's a very short show today. I'm going to cut it short. We're going to always put these graduates on our second uh, channel. And if you were just here, I don't know what it is we're talking about. This is the Dojo training program. You can always type in training here. Um, and Alex Dodd wants to send me a game. Sure, Alex, send me a game, Bows. We'll look at it real quick. And then I have to meet later. Oh, I've got a book review to do. I'm going to review Modern Ideas in Chess by Ready, part of the program. And I'm going to talk to the famous Jack about the new site. The new site. All right, but Alex, you got to send it to me fast, Bows. you got to send it to me fast. So we can get it done. Here we go. Accept. All right, I think I can control paste. I can paste this thing. We're about to find out. Whoop. Uh-oh, no, that's not going to work. Yep. Okay. Share. Sharing and exporting were disabled by the study owner. Let's see. Mm, yeah, I don't think it's gonna work unless you you gotta you gotta enable me, Alex. You gotta enable me, Bows. All right, here we go. All right, here we come. So this is a game by Alex. And while we're, while we're here, actually, let's go briefly look at the scoreboard and contemplate. Alex's journey. Alex, oh, that's a little bit hard. It might not be in there. I know it's Alex Dodd, but he might have a different. Alex Dodd, there he is. So, um, Alex has gained 129 points, five points per box. That means it's working. And, uh, up to 1750. So Alex, if he gains one more point, he's going to call it in and we're going to have him on the graduate show in just a second. So 14 games analyzed. We're going to look at one of his games just real quick today. Mate in ones. Fantastic. Um, a, couple, a couple mate in twos. And some puzzle rush survival. Good. Okay. And you can see the main thing Alex is doing is the dojo game annotations and now cry can we get in there yes we can all right so this is alex against jude now one thing that anybody who's watched the show will know is that i Yell at people. <laughs> yell at people when they um, study too many openings at this level, right? 
they know that I'm going to yell at them. Alex already knew when he signed on to me looking at this game that I was going to yell at him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, for example, what has Alex done to his soul? He did that to his soul. Now, um, this takes a lot of understanding to understand, like, even why would you would consider playing Knight A4. Um, and, <laughs> like, he's looking at this crazy line. He's playing an 1100 and thinking the 1100 might go for this E5. Look at this line that Alex has memorized. I mean, that's, that's the definition of highfalutin right there. When they invented the word highfalutin, that was the, <laughs> that was the thing that they were imagining. <laughs> That's some highfalutin stuff, man. <sighs> okay, so this is the our CFC ratings. I think that means Canadian. Yeah, still, still. When the in the Dojo training program, one of the great things we've said is like until you are twelve hundred, you are not allowed twelve hundred according to the FIDE system. You are not allowed to study openings. Everybody still studies openings. And let's imagine for a moment that White didn't know anything, right? So the moves that would be coming to mind would be here, 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 here. Maybe even the weird G3. All those moves are principled, right? And um, it, let's say you just didn't know. You'd be fine as long as each of your moves followed the principles. Whereas knight a4, let's just talk about it. Okay, so this is very highfalutin. What is the idea? The idea is to avoid this exchange and to get this tempo for free. Super highfalutin. All right, let's see. Black is probably going to just play bishop g7. No. Okay, knight b6. It would be really cool to play knight c3. Okay, bishop g7, fine. Castles, knight f3, <clears throat> and now knight a4. Okay, so let's talk about knight a4. Knight a4 is mildly controversial because you are helping white develop the queen. Okay. Um, c5, d1, and let's read what Alex says. This is my last move of prep. Opponent said after the game he was out of prep around move something or other. Okay, so, um, yeah, black is, black is fine. Let's talk about this from a highfalutin perspective. So, um, white is obviously waiting to castle and nurturing this central position. Um, and Maybe we can say white has the advantage if we turn on the computer, but it's honestly kind of hard to say just with the human mind because white has a couple moves before they castle. Big decision for black, CD, queen c7, all of these things are plausible moves for black. Okay, now to me the big question is what happens after d5 here? What did white do? Bishop e2, okay. So, the reason why d5 was my big question was, oh God, chess.com, you're just killing me, Bose. You're just killing me. Um, is that if we have to, I don't know where black moves the knight, and then aren't we winning this thing after? And then we can claim that we have the center and all of the advantages in the position. Okay. Now, maybe DC as well, which is in the notes. Um, but this is at the minimum dangerous because black has uh, the jump in development, right? For example, let's say here in this position. It's complicated. Like they might, um, they might get enough play after something weird like this. 
Oh, chess.com, boss. You're just, it's just killing me, man. It really is destroying my soul. Is it me? Am I the one who's doing it? Anyways, I don't know. Pop. Oh, okay, I can't. I can't. In any case, DC was interesting. I also thought knight c6 was interesting. Apparently, variation is no point over here. Okay, so here we go. Critical variation. CD. Knight d4. In general, I think the guy should be fine now. So queen a5 is a little highfalutin. Why? Because the knight might be out of play on a5. So the boring way to play, and probably the best, is to trade. And so, Alex, here would be a good time to uh, do some annotations here about this variation. Maybe they can play bishop d7 as well. Be a little funky, obviously. The intention of bishop d7 would be, can we get away with that creepiness? Maybe. Maybe we can. A little bit unclear. That would be a good variation to look at. And then this one is the most plausible for black just because black can say, hey, uh, you still owe me a tempo, and I should be able to equalize that without any grief. That's why in this position, like either d d5 is the most sensible to me. Okay. <laughs> That's right, Charles. It's time for chess.com to break up with the girlfriend, move to St. Louis. <laughs> okay, CD. This is, in fact, what happens. Knight d4, queen a5. Controversial. Pop, pop. Now, here's an interesting, instructive moment. Um, white castles, it certainly makes us some sense. But we should also very much consider, could we keep the king in the middle of the board somehow? So in addition to castling, I would stress that f3, king f2 makes some good sense. Because ultimately, right, when we castle, we are undeveloping the king. We will need to make a Luft move, and we're going to need to bring the king back anyway. So f3 makes a lot of sense here. Black needs a plan. Um, I'm not a huge fan of this move, and I think black's default move should be bishop d7. Why? Because it's the developing move! <laughs> Yeah, that's the developer right there. And then the standard Grunfeld thing, right, is to play for this, and this, I mean, rook c8 and the c4 square. Okay, here we go. a6, and now white gets really frisky with b4. Probably, may be correct. Let's read Alex's notes. I decided to kick black's knight away with b4 after much deliberation. I did hesitate to play this move as it offers to trade my great knight for his bad knight, but I am able to weaken his queenside pawns in the process. I also get my pawn out of the side of his dark square bishop. However, his response surprised me. Okay. Um, I think it's reasonable. I think b4 is an interesting try, in particular because black re has refused to develop. Right? He's just determined not to develop. Um, so, also, it's not, it's not that easy to figure out what else we're going to do in this position. Like rook d2, maybe, you know, there's not, there's nothing too, maybe rook c1, you know, it's a little hard, a little hard to say exactly what we should do. So b4, oh my god, chess.com, it is time for you, Baus to break up with your girlfriend, and to move to St. Louis. So the key variation would definitely be pop, 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 and then I'm not sure why we would play a3. Because we're worried about bishop e6. Um, 
So right, this would definitely have been the main continuation, and then we have simple questions of, is black going to get counterplay here? Enough counterplay, and I guess a5 is the move, which um, maybe black is looking to do. So bishop b6 seems truly a strange move to play, but maybe, I don't believe in bishop b6. But anyways, that's a move to think about. Um, on a3, I'm assuming a5 is the right move for black, you know, and then the play kind of goes on from there. Okay, in any case, e5. And that looks like a big mistake. So ba, correct. ED, bishop d4. Okay, yeah, so you are up a pawn, and the pawn on b7 is now a huge weakness. And now bishop e6. And now we're going to consider your options. Um, I'm not a fan of bishop c5. Right, not a fan. Um, and one interesting thing is black taking the pawn on a2 is fairly inconsequential, right? Okay, first thing is I'm not sure um, I'm not sure what the point of bishop c5 is. Like what are we doing there? Right. Well, yeah, why are we playing bishop c5? It's just the guy's going to knock us. So let's say some basic things. A standard endgame position here where um, we have at least a clear advantage. And um, it's not that easy to know how to play it. Maybe something like snop, snip. Oh, God, chess.com. You're killing me, Bows. Bows. I'm dying. All right, bishop g7, king g7, rook b1. And if a passive move, like rook a b8, maybe, maybe black should play rook f d8 and then, you know, threaten that nasty thing. <laughs> Point being, if we win the, I mean, it's complicated, man. It's complicated. So I, I think this is still um, an interesting technical position for white. At first, I just want to say my intuition was that it had to be simply winning. I guess I still feel that way. Maybe our. So the issue with let's say snip, snop. Rook d2 is that rook c8 is going to come, and then we have to worry about rook c5. Still, maybe that's the way to go. Pop, pop, pop. Let's, if rook fd8, rook fd1. Like that, right? It's still, still very complicated. Still very complicated. Okay, so bishop c5, I don't understand. Why wouldn't, why rook f8? No one knows. Why not rook fc8? Let's see the variation here. Rook fc8, bishop b6. But why would we do bishop c5? Why would we do it? And then here, there's no need to take. Now black can go ahead and play rook c2. And then black is, I don't know, hard to, black might not even be worse anymore, right? Not that big old fatty rook. So, yeah, I think bishop c5 you should feel, you should feel tormented about. f8, no one knows. a3, check to the rook, that doesn't make any sense. Um, now, maybe these things got somehow truncated when I took it to chess space because it says my time, and so I'm assuming there was a time there. In the atonement time, 103. I don't know if that's hours or minutes. 
Um, let me read the read the preface over here. There was something about no, there was nothing about the time. So yeah, I don't know how the, the notes got cut off. So rook, bishop b three makes no sense. By the way, let me just stress something that. Um, Okay, wait, time out, Jesse. <laughs> time out. Let, be a little kinder. <laughs> this is V3. He wants to talk to the E4 pawn. Okay, fine. All right. So we understand that Black is actually... I'm trying to get behind Black's uh, thought process here. Bishop V3. And now... Rook b1 is natural. Rook d7, though, looks very strong as well because I don't think you want to take it because this thing lands, this thing lands, and then we're talking to this thing, right? Okay, so if there's a problem with rook b1, we're going to want to talk about uh, rook d7. Bishop c2. And then rook e4. And then definitely we don't want to play rook takes b3 when we want to play bishop here, right? That looks, uh, that looks crushing. Imagine rook c4 and then move the bishop somewhere, you know, probably here. And then this thing's got to go, this is going to go, this is going to go. And it's a very, it's very hard to defend because once we smack here, this this coming next. So like bishop c2, we're here, we got the discovery threat, it's a real pain. Okay, so bishop c2, that was black's intention, right. Now, black was annoyed by this move, but um, Maybe we have nothing better. But it's a bummer to give up our beautiful rook. Okay, so big moment for black. Let's see what black does. Okay, so when it says opponent time 103, let me just stress something. <laughs> okay, so it did, does mean hour. So one hour three, they started with one hour 30. Both players are not, are moving too fast, right? They're both moving too fast in those crazy complications that we had earlier. Okay, pop, pop. So this is the whole problem with the rook b7, rook e7 thing, is that it's this is not going to be uh, some simple endgame. So let's go back and say that that was reasonable for black. And rook d7 looks correct. If And if we want to improve this one, then we need a better answer on this move. This looks really weird, but maybe even like bishop f3. Um, yeah, we have to do something fancy now to win this. So rook b6, if bishop g2, we can consider that weirdness. Also very highfalutin though, not, not clear because we're going to still have to, it might, it might work out. Uh, no, well, yes, maybe, I don't know, it's going to be really complicated. But this is not it. 
because rookie eight's a good plan. And now the problem, see, with bishop a6 and that variation we want to go for it now is that um, without the rook, if, if black had two rooks and we had a rook and a bishop, it would be more plausible. Here, uh, it shouldn't be, black should be fine. Diversity principle, right? If, because we, we need the rook in action. But, but obviously, if we want to take the pawn, we can't. So now black should be fine. Does white have a little bit of something, something? No. <laughs> no, right? Black's got that pawn. Black's got that pawn on the king side. So rook e8 is a passive move. Well, let's stress that, okay? And black should play, should be thinking about uh, moves um, like h5 because black has more stuff on the king side. Right? So passive move. Uh, uh, in general, what we see at this level is passiveness, and we're going to get to it right away. So boom, boom, passive. Okay, now white definitely has the advantage. Okay, h3, that make, move makes me want to die, Alex. Okay. So there is a point to it, and Alex is concerned with bishop e5 after king f3. Okay. Now, let's just say, I guess black is still in the realm of holding this thing. But to put the rook on a8, not the happiest moment, right? Now, if the guy's just going to sit, then we're going to have to put our king here. To win this thing. And the good news is, even though h3 makes me want to die, um, black, is, if they're going to be passive like this, they truly are just sitting on their hands for the next several moves. So maybe it doesn't make that big of a difference. Okay, so h3. <clears throat> My intuition is definitely rook b6 because the king needs to get here. That's the only way to win this thing. And also it would be nice to have rook b7 as an option. Okay. Okay, so you're legitimately terrified. I get it. Um, but let's, let's just think about this for half a second. So one question is this, though maybe bishop f4, king d3, g4. I don't know, hard for me to evaluate. The next one is king d3. And then if g4, then rook h6. No, but then king g7 or something, right? Okay. So it's legitimately a little bit terrifying. Good. And so let's say what happens here is black, one of the reasons to believe that black should be fine is are those pawns. Now, should he have put his rook on a8? No way. <laughs> no way. But still, let's see if we could do better than what happened in the game here. So um, <clears throat> I think rook b6 is a good starting move. Now black would, could play h5, f5, all kinds of things. Um, let's imagine f5 is not a bad move. King f3. Let's do this bishop e5 thing. Now maybe h4. Let's try h4 just for kicks. No, it's... Well, I don't know. Well, let's put on h3. I don't know. King f7. And the problem now is black at least has to think about this rook b7 move. Now, maybe he should just 
let us take on h7, honestly, and activate the rook. But the problem for a soul like Black, who has already committed himself to a passive defense, is that he's probably just going to go back in shame. You see what I'm saying? Like here, you know, finally activate somehow. You know, King g5 or something. Uh, King g5 is not going to work. So that's the point. So the rook on b6 is better. At least it gives a question. So if Black wants to draw this thing, maybe h5. Let's just give it a try. King h7 first maybe is better. Actually, it is better because king e4 is coming. This is nice because... Uh, Well, you can see it's very dangerous here for black. Very dangerous. So rook b6. And the idea is, do we have enough time to reach b7 before the counterplay starts? The short answer is we don't know. <laughs> but we got, we have, we get it, especially if black plays passively, like they've done with, with rook a8, then we're going to win. That much is for certain. They have to find, they have to at some point be like, oh, <laughs> I screwed up. And now I'm going to have to activate that rook. <clears throat> Where did the rook belong? It belonged on e6. Right? Okay. Yeah. Alex is asking, what about 28f4? That's a thought. In general, the good rule of thumb is that um, the. Pawn moves on your weak side, your weaker on the king's side, will help your opponent make pass pawns uh, on their strong side or do things on their strong side. But f4, I like the spirit of it better than, um, than h3. One first piece of bad news, though, is that is a drawn rook and pawn enemy. So that's already one reason to play rook b6. Um, but black, I don't know. I guess black's not going to do it, though. Right? <laughs> Feels like, no, yeah, they might They might play. Yeah, they'll still maybe play it. Um, f4 is fine. I like rook b6 much better because that's where the rook is going to want to go. So maybe like here, and then you're going to have to babysit this pawn, and this something is going to happen. Happen a little later. Yeah. Okay. Good. That was a good game, though, Alex. That was a good game. Now, let me just go back a second and look at our famous training plan and just make a couple quick remarks. Okay? So I'm going to switch scenes here. Do I generally forget the switch? I often do. So here's Alex in the 14 to 1500 cohort. Now Alex is, wait a second. Alex is, uh, it, now by the way, if you're using the CFC ratings, you should, that's what you should stick to. That's great. Um, gone up mucho points and let's just be clear cry. <laughs> <laughs> Alex is allowed to study some, some openings at this point, okay? You jerk, you big jerk, he's allowed to do it, okay? And uh, some good annotations. Definitely before openings, though, I want to stress that's a great thing to do. And then um, the books, great. And end game day, leg day. Alex is doing it. Look at that. Right there. Boom. So very good. Yeah. And also, you mean you're very close. You're very close to going up into the next cohort. You could, you could, you know, this <laughs> is one point away. <laughs> that's one point away, Alex. So that's good, man. That's good. So now I have to repent. I'm going to repent a little bit for saying that you weren't allowed to study openings. Okay. <laughs> 
I got stuck on a made in two and haven't gone back since. Now, I almost said that's what she said, but I had it a didn't. Okay, I didn't say it. <laughs> All right, everybody, I'm out of here. So, who are we going to raid today? Oh, I can't do James Blunder. That guy got canceled. Charles Hamilton is always saying I got canceled too, but I'm not big enough to cancel. There's no, there's no, if you're not, not a big enough person, there's no, there's no canceling of anything. There's no substance to cancel. Let's uh, read simply Davina, friend of the dojo through Mr. GM Josh Fidel. Okay, guys, we'll be, I'll be back tomorrow. I have to do, I have to find, I have to settle the games of the aggressive uh, opening repertoire. We're going to do more model games. And next week, we'll probably have more graduates. All right, bye. Everybody.